Hi everyone, here we are again for Ways of the World, a brief global history with sources. We start our study today with uh, part four, chapter 13, political transformations, empires, and encounters. So let's start with the Mughal Empire of India. So among the most magnificent of the early modern era was that of the Mughals here in India. In this painting by an unknown Mughal artist, the 17th century emperor Shah Jahan is holding a durbar or ceremonial assembly in the audience hall of his palace. The material splendor of the setting shows the immense wealth of the court, while the halo around Shah Jahan's head indicates the special spiritual grace or enlightenment associated with emperors. Now, what techniques of state management are suggested in the illustration? Well, the image of an imperial jabbar portrays a means by which men could relate grievances to and get information from the ruler. All right, so let's start with the European advantage. And right, we're going to look at geography. So the European Atlantic states were well positioned for involvement in the Americas. Currents and winds had forced Western mariners to create maneuverable ships. Um, the Chinese and Indians had such rich markets in the Indian Ocean, there wasn't much incentive to go beyond, so that created the need. Europeans uh, were aware of their marginal position in Eurasian commerce and wanted to change that. There's inter interstate rivalry uh, within Europe that drove rulers to compete with one another. A growing merchant class wanted to wanted direct access to Asian wealth. And that wealth and status uh, meant something. Colonies were an opportunity for impoverished nobles and commoners. And lastly, religion. That crusading zeal uh, carried over into the modern era. And, and there were many that were persecuted as minorities. And they were looking for more freedom, particularly for religion. All right, so here's map 13.1, uh, the European colonial empires in the Americas. By the beginning of the 18th century, European powers had laid claim to most of the Western Hemisphere. Their wars and rivalries during that century led to an expansion of Spanish and English claims at the expense of the French. So which European power controlled the most territory in the Americas? Well, that would be the Spanish. They controlled the most territory. And which controlled the least? That's the Dutch. They controlled the least amount of territory. So now we're going to look at connections. So we have this map here of the European colonial empires in the Americas, but we're also going to take a look at um, map 16.3. And I know we're not in chapter 16 yet, uh, but I do want to take a look at this and, and compare because here the first one we see the European colonial territories, but here we see the former colonies, uh, those that had gained independence, and then what year uh, is there or date of their independence. So which European powers lost control of their Central and South American colonies by the 1830s? Which retained theirs? Which did both? Well, according to this map, Spain and Portugal lost their Central and South American colonies, while the French retained theirs and the Dutch retained part of Guiana, the western part having already been lost to Britain. Now, the Spanish also maintained two of their Caribbean colonies, Cuba and Puerto Rico, while the French lost control of Haiti. However, the Caribbean is generally considered a distinct region from Central and, Samar excuse me, Central and South America, and as such is not applicable to that particular question. All right, the European advantage continued. All right, so European states and trading companies definitely mobilized their resources well. Uh, the seafaring technology like map, ma map making, particularly cartography, navigation, sailing techniques, and ship design were a part of that. Iron, gunpowder, weapons, and horses definitely gave Europeans an, the initial advantage over the peoples in the Americas. There were European, excuse me, American collaborators. Uh, rivalries within the groups and tribes in the Americas provided allies for European invaders. And the indigenous troops allied to the Spanish far outnumbered the small number of European soldiers. And probably one of the um, largest advantages for the Europeans was the decimation of the Native American populations by European diseases. All right, let's talk about Doña Marina. She's there on the left, uh, here translating for Cortez. In her brief life, 
Uh, she was known variously as Malinao, Doña Marina, and La Malinche. But whatever name, she was a woman who experienced the encounter of the old world and the new in particularly intimate ways, even as she became a bridge between them. She was born around 1505 uh, and was the daughter of an elite and cultured family in the borderlands between the Mayan Aztec cultures and what is now southern Mexico. Two dramatic events decisively shaped her life. The first occurred when her father died and her mother remarried, bearing a son to her new husband. And so to protect his, this boy's inheritance, Malinao's family sold her into slavery. Eventually, she came into the possession of a Maya chieftain in Tabasco on the Gulf of Mexico. Here, her second life-changing event took place in March of 1519. When the Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés landed his troops and inflicted a sharp military defeat on Tabasco. In the negotiations that followed, Tabasco authorities gave lavish gifts to the Spanish, including 20 women, and one of them was Malinao. Now, described by Bernal Diaz, one of Cortés' associates, as, quote, good-looking, intelligent, and self-assured, the teenage Malinao soon found herself in service to Cortés himself. Now, since the Spanish men were not supposed to touch non-Christian women, these newcomers were distributed among his officers, quickly baptized, and given Christian names. Thus, Malinao became Doña Marina. Now, with a ready ear for languages and already fluent in Mayan and Nautil, which is the language of the Aztecs, John, excuse me, Doña Marina soon picked up Spanish and quickly became indispensable to Cortez as an interpreter, cross-cultural broker, and strategist. She accompanied him on his march inland to the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, and on several occasions, her language skills and cultural awareness allowed her to uncover spies and plots that might have seriously impeded Cortez's defeat of the Aztec Empire. Now, Diaz reported that Doña Marina, quote, Doña Marina uh, understood full well what was happening and told Cortez what was going on. Now, in the Aztec capital, where Cortez took the Ember Montezuma captive, it fell to Doña Marina to, to persuade him to accept his, this uh, humiliating position and surrender his wealth to the Spanish. Even Cortez, who was never very gracious with his praise for her, acknowledged that, quote, after God, we owe this conquest of New Spain to Doña Marina. Aztecs soon came to this, um, to see this young woman as the voice of Cortez, referring to her as La Malinche, a Spanish approximation of her original name. So, paired did Cortez and La Malinche became, uh, become an Aztec thinking or excuse me, in Aztec thinking that Cortez himself was often called Malinche. Now, more than an interpreter for Cortez, Doña Marina also became his mistress and bore him a son. But after the initial conquest of Mexico was complete and he no longer needed her skills, Cortez married Doña Marina off to another Spanish conquistador, one uh, Jaramillo, Jaramí with whom she lived until her death, now, probably around 1530. Cortez did provide her with several pieces of land, one of which, ironically, had belonged to Montezuma, and her son, however, was taken from her and raised in Spain. In 1523, Doña Marina performed one final service for Cortez, accompanying him on a mission to Honduras, or what is present-day Honduras, to suppress a rebellion. There, her personal life seemed to come full circle, for near her hometown, she encountered her mother, who had sold her into slavery, and her half-brother. Diaz reported that, quote, were very much afraid of Doña Marina, thinking that they would surely be put to death by their uh, now powerful and well-connected relative. But in a replay of the biblical story of Joseph and his brothers, Doña Marina quickly reassured and forgave them while granting them, quote, many golden jewels and some clothes. In the century since her, her death, she's been highly controversial. For much of the colonial, colonial era, she was viewed positively as an ally of the Spanish, but after independence, some came to see her as a traitor to her own people, shunning her heritage and you know, siding with the invaders. Still, others have considered her as the mother of Mexico's mixed race or mestizo culture. Uh, should she be understood primarily as a victim or as a skillful survivor, negotiating hard choices under difficult circumstances? You know, whatever the judgments of later generations, Zona Marina herself, seems to have made a clear choice to cast her lot with the Europeans. Even when Cortez had given her to another man, Doña Marina expressed no regret. According to Diaz, she declared, quote, Even if they were to make me mistress of all the provinces of New Spain, 
I would refuse the honor, for I would rather serve my husband and Cortez than anything else in the world. All right, the Great Dying and the Little Ice Age. So global significance in the, or there's global significance of the demographic collapse of the Native American societies. Uh, Pre-Columbian Western Hemisphere had a population of approximately 60 million to 80 million people. Uh, the geographic isolation meant the population had no immunity to old world diseases. The Europeans brought European and African diseases with them across the Atlantic. The mortality rate was of up to 90% among Native American populations. Um, it nearly vanished in the Caribbean. In central Me Mexico, the population dropped from 10 million, around 20 million, to only around 1 million by 1650. And there's a similar mortality rate in North America. Uh, there's massive death that created a social crisis. The epidemic spread of disease coincided with global, the global phenomenon of the Little Ice Age. The cooling temperatures sparked the general crisis. There's erratic rainfall near the equator. And the social distress is seen in constant warfare in Europe, uh, the collapse of the Ming, and the civil war in Mukala, India. And the drought in Mexico and torrential rains uh, are part of that in the Caribbean. All right, the Columbian Exchange. There's massive native mortality in Little Ice Age uh, created a labor shortage in the Americas. And the migrant Europeans and African slaves created an entirely new society. Well, I should say new societies in the Americas. Um, it brought European crops and animals to the Americas. 90% uh, of old growth forests destroy, were destroyed for fields and pastures. Uh, European animals... For example, horses, pigs, cattle, goats, sheep thrived without predators. Uh, women lost the, agricult the agricultural role as horses influenced the hunter culture among Native Americans. Uh, the American food crops like uh, corn, potatoes, and cassa uh, cassava spread widely in eastern uh, the hemisphere, in the eastern hemisphere. Uh, potatoes especially allowed enormous population growth. And corn and sweet potatoes were important in China and Africa. Now, the American stimulants like tobacco and chocolate also spread to the Eastern Hemisphere. A tea and coffee uh, from the Islamic world spread globally. And there's also a network of communication, migration, trade, disease, transfer of plants and animals, including microbes, that is ultimately called the Columbian Exchange. And in the Atlantic world connected but now connected four continents, and Europeans got most of the rewards. All right, so this is disease and death among the Aztecs. Uh, smallpox, which accompanied the Spanish to the Americas, devastated native populations. And this image, drawn by an Aztec artist and contained in the 16th century Florentine Codex, illustrates the impact of those diseases in Mesoamerica. So what historical factors made Europeans less susceptible to the diseases they brought pictured above than the indigenous population? Well, long isolation from the Afro-Eurasian world meant that Native Americans had never been exposed to these pathogens before and had not developed a resistance to them. Also, a lack of large domesticated animals provided less opportunity to develop immunity from diseases that jumped the species barrier. And that concludes our study of European empires in the Americas. I will see you guys again uh, for comparing colonial societies.